Well, we've arrived at I've Lost Track, the next podcast in our discussion of electronic structure in the atom. And now what we're going to try to examine is the energy levels that can be found in Bohr's model. Bohr said that there are only specific orbits in which an electron is allowed to be. Think of an analogy as you climb up a ladder. You can have your feet on the rungs of the ladder. You can go put your foot on the next rung of the ladder, but you can't really put your foot in between the rungs of the ladder. And those he envisioned as being a circular orbit, sometimes called a shell, that was at a very specific distance from the nucleus. And there were multiple shells in his model. The greater the radius that shell, that meant the farther out from the center of the atom the electron was in that energy level or shell, and so the greater energy it would have had. And we learned earlier we could calculate the energy of these electrons if we know Planck's constant and the frequency. So these electron orbits are what are called energy levels. <clears throat> and to some extent, they still hold true today. You learn that when electrons absorb energy from an outside source, they can jump from a lower to a higher energy level. Now they have to absorb certain specific bundles of energy to do that, called quanta. And when they are at their high energy level, they have to originally go, or go back to their original levels and give off the energy they absorbed in the form of photons of light. And these photons of light have the same amount of energy in them, measured in quanta, that were originally absorbed to kick the electron up in the first place. So there's a little video here showing the electrons constantly bouncing up and bouncing back down as long as they're absorbing energy from an outside source. That could be in our labs, Bunsen burner flames or electricity, or you might even have enough energy in sunlight, for example, that will allow electrons to get excited and leap up to higher energy levels. Now we reviewed this today in class, how far from the nucleus you go, and notice that there are six energy levels here, determines the energy that either was required to absorb and move up to that level, or is released when you return down from that level. And what one bore the Nobel Prize is, he said, I'm going to do the math first. I think there are these pre-existing energy levels. I'm going to do the calculations. I'll be able to count, calculate the energy. From that, I'll be able to calculate the frequency. And from that, I could find the wavelength. And I know that wavelengths correspond to a particular color that the human eyeball sees. So he did the math first, predicted, and then observed the spectral lines in a simple hydrogen atom. Our experiment will be looking at waves of light coming out at me at spectral lines and then going backwards and using the cheat sheet method taking the equations from Nobel Prize winning uh, chemists and physicists to be able to calculate the energy of the photons of light that were emitted by excited electrons returning from a higher state to their ground state. We're going to go backwards. So his calculated energies actually matched and IR stands for infrared the visible, and the ultraviolet lines that would have been predicted for the hydrogen atom. Here we're only looking at the visible light that we can see. So <clears throat> I'm not sure what this sentence is because there's some grammatical error, but you know that when you're in your ground or normal state, the electrons are in their lowest energy levels that are available. It's just more energetically stable. And <clears throat> when all of the lowest energy levels are being occupied, we call that being in the ground state, or unexcited. Now you can see according to this picture, that when electrons move to a higher energy level, then the atom becomes in an excited state and is energetically unstable. So the picture over here on the right hand side is showing an electron being zapped and bouncing up to a higher state of or higher energy level and causing the atom in which it occupies a space to be more energetically unstable. The reverse is true as an electron drops down from a higher level to a lower 
it has to give off energy in this particular case a photon of light is going to be emitted. So atoms electrons can get excited just by being hit with photons of light as long as the right bundle of energy, a precise amount, struck them. Now when we see the bright line spectrum with those lines that are separated by regions of dark space, not the continuous rainbow, but individual bright lines of color, that actually represents the energy levels that are possible in atoms, according to Bohr's model. Now there were some problems though with his model. Remember Bohr solved the problem of Rutherford's model by saying if atoms electrons can only occupy specific energy levels, then that took care of the death spiral into the nucleus problem with the Rutherford model. Bohr's model worked pretty well for hydrogen, which only had one electron. But <clears throat> it only explains some of the lines in other elements that have more than one electron's bright line spectra. To be able to fix Bohr's model, we're going to have to bring it up one more level and add within each energy level certain sublevels. So we're going to have to subdivide them. And we're going to have to start thinking of electrons not going around the nucleus in perfect little circular orbits, but existing in fuzzy sort of clouds of space. And that will bring us to our next model in this modern model of the atom something that has to do with quantum mechanics. Now I'm only going to go part way into this, but the bottom line is we're trying to come up with a way to explain where electrons are because where they are, specifically the outermost electrons, is what's so important in determining chemical behavior. So in classical mechanics, that's the laws of physics that would govern when a car drives down the street or a plane flies across the sky, or a train goes down the train tracks. Objects that you can see that are moving at normal speeds. And we call that classical or Newtonian mechanics or Newtonian physics. And you know some of those. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Those kind of laws. And that works if we can see the objects and they're traveling at normal speeds. Bohr's model couldn't necessarily explain why the electrons would stay at one energy level or another. And one of the fallacies of his model is if you looked really, really close at some of those spectral lines, you could see maybe two lines that at first glance appeared to be one. So we're starting to see some problems in his model, even though it was a Nobel Prize winning experiment. So what we came up with is something called quantum mechanics. And it's a different kind of physics that's pretty far out there. I'll be able to say the words. I can't pretend that I necessarily understand it fully. But it's a different kind of physics that describes when you have incredibly tiny particles like electrons that you can never see moving at velocities that are near the speed of light. It's very weird because they can it's kind of like they can be everywhere and nowhere at the same time because they're moving nearly at the speed of light and they have incredibly tiny distances to cover the interior of an atom. So we had to come up with another set of rules. Now when you couple this understanding with the work done by Louis de Broglie and by Planck's, by Planck, excuse me, you get back to that concept of duality, that sometimes you can have electron streams acting like waves of light, and sometimes they act like they're little particles or bundle of energy, and sometimes they act like continuous or contiguous streams of wave-like energy. So what Schrodinger is famous for is trying to come up with a description of explaining where electrons are based upon something called quantum mechanics. And essentially he created a series of equations that we aren't even going to touch with a 10 meter pole, not a 10 foot pole, which are equations that can only describe the probability of finding an electron, if you could even see them, in a particular place in space. As you'll find out, these equations correspond 
to clouds around the electrons, around the atom center. And we can only say that we might be able to find these electrons at any moment in time within these shapes that we'll discuss later. And yet he was able to draw or create equations that describe those electron clouds. That's what a wave equation is. Now when I see you in class next, I'll talk to you about Schrodinger's cat. It's kind of a weird analogy to try to talk to you about how you can never really be certain where electrons are. A little bit easier for me to do that in person. But what we can say, if you took a simple element like hydrogen and helium, they only have one and two electrons respectively. If I could somehow stop time and freeze and hold an electron in its place, if this represents the sphere here, at the center represented is the unseen nucleus, 90% of the time I'd find hydrogen or helium single or double electrons somewhere in a region of space that's roughly described by the shape of a sphere. Now think of this as a special piece of paper that every time electrons struck it, they left a little mark. See how most of the little marks are encased within this sphere? That sucker's called an orbital. And we have an equation that can describe that space as well as describe or describe that cloud as well as describe its orientation in space. So what we're saying is that I have a pretty good chance of finding one or two electrons of hydrogen and helium in a sphere that's a cloud, not a circle, but a sphere. Think three-dimensional, closer into the nucleus. Well, the problem is you can never be certain of where an electron is. This is the famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And basically he was saying, if you can kind of figure out where they are, you don't really know how fast they're going. Or if you kind of know how fast they're going, you're not really entirely sure where they are. It's pretty weird. Um, you can think of it this way maybe. If you look at a fan, its blades of the fan move so fast that it's like a blur. And so I know somewhere in there, somewhere in there are the blades of the fan. I'm not sticking my hand in there to find out where they are but I know that somewhere in that region of space are the fan blades. Well, Heisenberg called the region of space where there's a high probability of locating an electron an orbital. And orbitals come in all different flavors and shapes, but each of the main energy levels that Bohr described can be subdivided into different orbitals or electron clouds. So Bohr <coughs> might show the model of uranium as a series where its electrons are, as a series of concentric circles. In one sense, that's sort of true. But each of these concentric circles, after the first energy level here, can be subdivided into sublevels, which are the individual types of shapes of clouds that we will learn how to recognize and write specific mathematical looking equations that describe where electrons are. But we do know that the farther you are from the nucleus, those are higher energy electrons, and the closer into the nucleus are your lower energy sublevels, levels, and electrons that occupy them. I'm going to stop there <clears throat> because at this point in time, we're getting into electron configuration. But I'll discuss later on how it is you can take a series of numbers letters, and small numbers to write a street address, so to speak, for where you might be able to locate an electron. I'll catch up to you on the next and hopefully last podcast. Make sure you check on Moodle to see if there is a post-vodcast activity for this segment. Take care.